All right, we'll go ahead and get started today. Can everyone hear me okay? It's on. Can you hear me? All right, sounds good. All righty. In many religious circles, there are certain arguments that are commonly used to prove a particular tenet or belief, and uh, some arguments become staples over time. They're used from one generation to the other. Uh, the purpose of these arguments is to prove that their point is correct and dismantle the belief of their opponent. Uh, one of my favorite uh, arguments that are found in Scripture is in Matthew 22, uh, verses 23 through 33. Now, for time's sake, we're not going to read the whole thing. Yes, sir? Oh, uh, today we're doing uh, something different. We're sort of continuing the, the lectureship. I'm going to be uh, uh, speaking today uh, on the topic, Can We Be Saved Like the Thief on the Cross? No, no we're going to do something a little different. Sorry about that. Anywho, one of my favorite uh, arguments from Scripture that is similar to the one we're going to talk about today is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 33. And this was a question that was posed to Jesus to try and trip him up. And I'm going to be honest, if I hadn't heard Jesus' answer, I would have not known how to respond to such a question. On one particular day, the Sadducees, who believe some very interesting things, they believe in no afterlife, no resurrection, no spirit, no angel or anything like that. They came up with a conundrum to try to mess with Jesus. They bring up a scenario, a hypothetical scenario, where they're about a woman who was married seven, seven different times, and each time her husband died. And they said, okay, if she's been married all of these times, who's going to be her husband in the resurrection? You guys say there's a resurrection. How is she going to be married to all these men? And of course, as we'll see with the argument we're about to look at, there are several issues with the argument they're trying to make. It's built off false presuppositions and they're ignoring plain scripture. Well, Jesus responds to their false presupposition. He says, there no one marries in the afterlife. No one marries at the resurrection. We're like angels. We're not given in marriage. And two, they ignored a very important passage from the Old Testament. You see, Jesus didn't quote any of the passages from the, the prophets or uh, uh, the historical literature after the Law of Moses because they only accepted the Law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. So he says, or excuse me, he quotes God in saying, I am the God of Moses, excuse me, sorry, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He plainly says, well, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God does not say, I was the God of Abraham or I was the God of Isaac, or I was the God of Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, meaning that Abraham is still alive. Uh, today, I want to look at a particular argument that uh, we run into a lot. And I know from personal experience, this is something I run into quite often. Uh, based off our belief that baptism is essential for salvation, many people respond by saying, well, what about the thief on the cross? And what they mean by that is, well, the thief on the cross was not baptized, and yet he still was, Je he still was with Jesus in the afterlife. Can't we be saved without being baptized? And uh, this is a, a question that I, I ran into a few months ago while I was at UCF. Uh, I, I was over there evangelizing, and I had a really good conversation with a, a young man about my age over there. And we believe some very different things, but we're about to swap some contact information and go get pizza and uh, talk about some of our differences. Well, one of his friends came up and asked where I go to church. And I said, well, I'm a member at the South Seminole Church of Christ. And then it registered to him exactly what I believed. And he opened his mouth as though he was about to say something and then closed it and said, you know what, I, I probably shouldn't. And I said, well, I'm not, sh I'm not shy. You can say whatever you want to me. And he said... Well, you believe that baptism is for salvation. I was like, well, yes, I do. I believe it is an essential part to one becoming a Christian. And he said, well, what about the thief on the cross? And we're going to talk about some of the arguments he made as we go through this lecture. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a, a very beautiful passage, the passage that he was referring to, Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. 
But I think, unfortunately, sometimes we, get to, we forget to appreciate the, the meaning of this passage because it seems like many people only use it as a battleground for arguing about baptism and we miss the point. But I think if we're going to uh, appreciate the, the beauty of this passage, we need to look at it in its appropriate context. So if you will turn with me to Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Luke chapter 23 Verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, that is, at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other... Uh, the one who was crucified, uh, the other one that was crucified beside Jesus. And the other answered and rebuking said to him, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same uh, sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering, suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man had done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now we see in this passage, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is in between uh, two robbers or, or two thieves, uh, depending on the, the translation, but basically the same thing. Uh, and one is mocking Jesus. He's insulting Jesus. He says, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. You know, it would be different if he was a little sincere about it, but as we see, he was maintaining his wickedness to the very end. While the other responds rebuking the other thief and acknowledging his own faults. And there are many important elements to his words. We notice that, one, he fears God. He is in fear that he is, to some degree, about to meet his maker. Uh, he realizes that he is here because he deserves to be. Now, this man on the cross has a lot to fear. He's about to die a very slow and painful death, and if he doesn't die that death fast enough, they're going to come and break his legs until he suffocates. So he has a lot on his mind. He has a lot to be worried about. And yet the thing he's worried about most is meeting God with a, pure, with a clear conscience. We notice that he acknowledges his sins. He says plainly that he deserves to be on the cross. He deserves to be crucified. Uh, as uh, John points out in 1 John 1.8, uh, we cannot come to God unless we first acknowledge our sins and our faults. Uh, John writes, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And we finally see that this thief, he confesses that Jesus is Lord. He says, remember me when you come into my kingdom. Now, some think that this man was a common criminal and that's very true. That, that could be, he could be just a common criminal. He might have a career of being a criminal. But I, I think we can conclude that there might be a little bit more to this man's story. Notice the amount of faith he has. Uh, and when we notice the amount of faith he has, we, we see the, the lack of faith many of the apostles have. Where are the apostles right now? There's only one beside Jesus, and that is John. The, other, uh, the others are running scared for their life. Their faith is shaken. Uh, Peter's already denied uh, Jesus, and the rest are, are doubting because they see Jesus in such a condition. And yet we see this thief who is dying the exact same kind of death that Jesus is, and his faith isn't shaken. When Jesus was on this cross, this destroyed the image of what his disciples thought the Messiah was supposed to be. But it didn't shake the faith of this man. He knew that Jesus still had a kingdom. Maybe he didn't fully understand it, but he knew that's where Jesus was going. And he knew eventually, if Jesus would allow him, he would be part of it. And because of this man's immense faith, Jesus forgave his sins. He says, truly I say to you, you shall be with me in paradise. And I think one of the beautiful things about this passage is it demonstrates the immense love of God uh, the, the immense amount of love that God has for us. Most relationships are based off what a person can do for someone else. This man has no, nothing more to give. 
except his mangled body and his uh, desperate gasp of air. He has nothing to offer Jesus. And in spite of that, Jesus still loves him deeply. Now, unfortunately, this beautiful passage is thought to dismantle our understanding of baptism. Many people say the thief on the cross uh, was not baptized. They say uh, since he was not baptized and he was with Jesus in the afterlife, it, that means we don't need to be baptized today. So throughout this lecture, I intend to demonstrate uh, four points that dismantle this argument. One, the thief on the cross was not saved in the sense that people mean it today. Two, there is no uh, proof that this thief was not baptized. Uh, three, the thief did not need to be baptized. And four, uh, the Son of Man had the authority to forgive sins. And there's only one point I'm going to look at very briefly. If you want to, you can turn over into your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 5. Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 5. And we see that John, the immerser, is baptizing all who were in Jerusalem and in Judea. Where is this man being crucified? He's in Judea, in the city of Jerusalem. Now, we can't take that passage and say, well, John, the immerser, baptized everyone. But we know that he baptized a lot of people. And we know that this thief has an, an immense amount of faith in Jesus. So at the very least, he has heard the teachings of John, the immerser. At the very least, he's heard the teachings of Jesus, or perhaps at the very least, he's seen a miracle. To some degree, he has witnessed Jesus throughout his life. Uh, so there is a chance that he was baptized, although it's not on us to prove that he was or he wasn't. They're the one making the argument, so they have to prove that he was not baptized. And there's no evidence to indicate that. The next point I want to look at is the, the thief on the cross was not saved in the sense that people mean it today. Now, of course, we all agree this thief was forgiven of his sins, and he went into paradise with Jesus. But when people say they are saved, what do they typically mean by that? When a person says, I am saved, or I was saved at this age or that age, they're normally referring to entering into a covenant or a relationship with God. It's more than simply being forgiven of sins. However, this thief on the cross, because he was a Jew, already had a relationship with God at some point in his life. In the Old Testament, a, a, a Jew was sort of born into a covenant with God, sort of born into a relationship with God. Uh, when people come to God today, they don't have that same kind of relationship. It doesn't mean that, for example, if you're a child, you're not in God's good graces or you're, you're, you're not going to heaven if you die. But you haven't established that relationship with God. This thief is not being saved in the sense of establishing a relationship. He is simply being restored to the relationship he already had. Therefore, we cannot use this man as a, a template to say that he was saved the same way people are saved today. The next point we need to look at is the thief on the cross did not need to be baptized. Uh, using the thief as a champion of non-baptismal salvation is extremely unusual, especially since he did not live in a world where Christianity was established. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 16, 28, that Jesus was preparing the world for the kingdom, for his church. We see that he's anticipating it. He's waiting for it to come. He tells his apostles that they're going to see the kingdom coming with power, implying that it was not on earth yet. The church had not yet been established. The church would not come until roughly 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, roughly 50 days after the thief was to die. Now, if Christianity was not in effect, what law was this man obligated to? When I was having this conversation with the man at UCF, uh, he asked me, well, if the thief on the cross was not baptized, why do I need to be baptized? And so I, I wanted to look at, at the, the, the context of this man being crucified. So I said, okay, well, we know what law we're under. What law was this man under? And I realized there he didn't have the building blocks, unfortunately, for this conversation. He said, the law of grace. Well, the law of grace is for Christians. 
it wasn't for the Jews. And I felt so sad for him because he, he believes this lie and he doesn't even know enough how to work himself out of it. You know, when you're in Bible class, uh, don't ever take for granted taking your kids to Bible class at such a young age. I remember uh, when I was roughly three years old, one of the first things that we would do when we would come into Bible class, we would talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we would emphasize the differences. Uh, and I, I was blessed to have my parents take me to church every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night, uh, Bible class every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night. And even those small lessons help me have the building blocks to understand the, the most basic principles of Scripture and to, and to appreciate the truth and, and to understand it for myself. But this man could not conceptualize that this man was under a completely different covenant. But he was, as we see from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, that Jews were under a unique covenant uh, uh, while the time of the law of Moses was in effect. And we know this law, this law of Moses was in effect because Jesus taught that it was. We see in Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, that Jesus taught that the law of Moses was still in effect and that the Jews were still obligated to it. Jesus plainly said that he did not come to abolish the law or to take it away or to, to get rid of it until all things had been fulfilled. Well, there were plenty of things left to be fulfilled. Jesus had not yet died. Jesus had not yet been resurrected. And Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father. So the law of Moses is still in effect. Now, what happens when a, a person uh, fails to keep the law of Moses? Well, they can either get atonement uh, for their sins through uh, sacrifices or they could, uh, in some cases, simply be forgiven by God. We see that when David sinned with Bathsheba, I'm not aware of any evidence that he made a particular sacrifice for that sin. He confessed his sins, and Nathan informed him that God had forgiven him. Well, what, uh, what is this thief doing? He's confessing his sins, and God is forgiving him. And... Uh, and if, and if he wanted to be in God's grace, that's, that's what he needed to do. Now, there are some issues with this argument. Uh, when people ignore the fact that this man was under a completely different law, they run into some serious issues. We could just as easily say, well, we don't have to take communion because the thief on the cross did not have to take communion. Or we could say, well, we don't have to go to church on Sunday morning because the thief on the cross didn't go to church on Sunday morning. Well, of course he didn't. He was not obligated to the Christian law. Saying the thief on the cross uh, did not need to be baptized is redundant to saying Moses did not need to be baptized. Well, obviously, Moses did not need to be baptized because he was under the law of Moses. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is an interesting facet to this, to this particular situation. Uh, though, the, though Jesus and the Jews lived under the law of Moses, the presence of Jesus himself adds an interesting facet to this conversation. Jesus had the ability on earth to forgive sins. It says in Mark 2.10, but so that you may know that the Son of Man had the authority uh, on earth to forgive sins. Uh, although Jesus was forgiving people of their sins, it does not mean he was miraculously making Christians left or right. And I did some reading online, and, and that's what actually some people think. I was reading an article from a, a man by the name, I think it was Evan uh, Mitten or, or something like that, and he talked about how Jesus made this guy on the cross a Christian. But he's not a Christian. Jesus is simply forgiving him of his sins and allowing him to restore his relationship with God. So can we be saved like the thief on the cross. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that most of us, if not all of us, are Gentiles. Uh, we are not Jewish, nor have likely any of our ancestors ever been Jewish or ever lived under the law of Moses. Another, uh, the next thing we need to consider is that the law of Moses is no longer in effect, as we see in uh, Hebrews 8.13. So how are we saved today? 
we're going to just talk about this for a moment and, uh, and then continue. One must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. One must repent of their sins, Luke uh, 13, 3, which is perhaps the most difficult part of becoming a Christian. A Christian. It's where one changes their mind, their heart, and their lifestyle to fit a, a life that is conforming to God's will. One must confess that uh, Jesus is Lord, Romans 10, 9. And one, we must be uh, baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2, 38. Sorry about that. Of course, this is where we disagree with most in the denominational world. A, a plain reading of Scripture would allow you to see that baptism plays a fundamental role in our salvation. As Peter clearly writes in 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism now saves you. The problem, or, or the issue, or I should say the stumbling block that, that gets in most people's way about understanding the need for baptism is because they're approaching the Bible with false presuppositions. They, they built their foundation and their understanding of the Bible uh, based on the teachings of man instead, instead of God. We see that uh, a man by the name of Martin Luther uh, came up with, this, with, with, with the doctrine of sola fide, that is, faith alone. And he did this in response to uh, the Catholic Church of his day. In certain areas of Europe, the Catholic Church uh, was very, very corrupt. Uh, they were trying to, many of them were, were trying to make money for, for one reason, uh, was to uh, build St. Uh, Peter's Basilica, and uh, so they came up with a marketing campaign to get more money. Uh, because Catholics believe in purgatory, they were able to use this to their advantage. Uh, there were many, uh, basically, salesmen like uh, Johann Tetzel who uh, talked about the awfulness of purgatory. And he explained to everyone that, you know, you likely have your grandmother in purgatory suffering right now. You likely have your grandfather in purgatory suffering right now. But there's a special opportunity. The, there's a, a grace, uh, I think a, it was described as a, a treasure trove of grace that has been opened. And if you'll donate money to the building of St. Peter's Basilica, we'll give you a little certificate that lets you know that whatever family, family member you want is no longer suffering in purgatory. <laughs> yeah, indulgences. Now, I don't know if this is an actual quote from Martin Luther or just from the movie. I just thought it was funny. He said, uh, you know, I gave all my money to get my grandfather out of purgatory, but I didn't have enough, so I left my grandmother there. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, now, Martin Luther, he tried to go back to the Bible, but he did not go far enough. He came up with the idea that we are saved by faith alone in response to the workspace, the money-based salvation of Catholicism of that day, but he went too far in the opposite direction. Uh, we know clearly from Scripture that, that faith alone cannot save. Uh, we see in James chapter 2, verse 24, the only time the word faith alone is found in Scripture is when James says that faith alone does not save, and, and you can read it there for yourself. Now, unfortunately, many people approach this idea when they read Scripture, with this idea firmly planted in their mind. And when they see anything more than faith, they get nervous because they've been taught that faith alone is the only thing that is necessary. And so in response, they often read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work so that no man, or so that no one may boast. Uh, and this is a, a fantastic passage. It's a beautiful passage, and there's nothing in it that I or any of us here today disagree with. Uh, but this pass, but when, when a person looks at a passage in isolation, they're breaking a fundamental hermeneutical rule. When you're trying to interpret the Bible, when you're trying to learn the Bible, or, or learn a, a particular a, a teaching from the Bible, 
what you do is you look at the passage in its immediate context. You try to understand what's going on. And then you consider the context of the whole book. What's the purpose of this book? What is this writer trying to communicate? And then you consider all the other passages related to this topic and the Bible. And once you have all the evidence before you, you come to your conclusion. Unfortunately, many people, they start reading the Bible with certain presuppositions, and then they look at certain passages in isolation, and they throw out the rest. But if, if you can get a person to, to, to set aside their presuppositions, to set aside what they've already been taught, and just look at Scripture plainly, for, for, uh, get a person to look at Scripture in a plain and simple way, most people will come to the conclusion that baptism is necessary for salvation. Uh, however, you may be able to even teach them the necessity of baptism with this false presupposition that faith alone is necessary. Of course, this is something you want to help them get rid of, but you might be able to work around their own doctrine and get them to accept uh, that baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, we, as, the, as members of the Church of Christ, are slanderously charged as teaching a workspace salvation. I've been told that many times because we feel that baptism is necessary for salvation. But, you know, in, in, all, my, in all my very short years, I, I've never heard that baptism was a work. I've never been taught that baptism was a work. I never thought of baptism as a work. When we baptize a person here, the elders don't hold up scorecards to rate how good their baptism was. David doesn't say, that was a good baptism. That guy's going to get a penthouse apartment in heaven. No, it, 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 <laughs> that's, that's not how we feel. That's not what we believe. In fact, we believe that baptism is the most, perhaps, the most passive act uh, of coming to God. Uh, look at what Peter says in Acts 2.38. Uh, Acts 2.38. We see that Peter says, repent and be baptized. Well, that, that uh, excuse me, in the Greek... That word baptized is in the, the passive mood. And what that means is that the subject is either being passive, doing nothing at all, or someone else is acting upon them. Now, when a person is baptized, you don't have to do a lot. You might have to just buckle your knees for a moment, but that's it. I don't know if that burns more calories than confessing the name of Jesus. You know, you might say one's more action than the other, one is more difficult than the other. But it's a passive act in which God washes your sins away, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, and someone else is doing all the work. It's a passive act. So maybe if, you, if you're trying to teach the gospel to someone and they, they believe that faith alone is all you need, maybe you can wedge in the teaching of baptism even around what they believe. I don't know. Let me know how it goes. But we see that baptism is essential. Baptism is important. And we know that we cannot be saved like the thief on the cross because we live in a very different time, a very different age, under a very different covenant. And if we wish to come to God, we must do it in the manner that he has laid out for us. Uh, and this is how we can be saved today. Thank you. Questions or any comments? Go ahead. Well, baptism is a work, then uh, giving and attending uh, worship is also a work. That, yeah, that's true. It's uh, typically, in, in many of the New Testament passages, when Paul is talking about a work, he's actually talking about uh, works of, of the law. Uh, what many people were doing in the uh, first century is that they were trying to be justified by the law of Moses, by doing certain things. Of course, a, a, a person could still run into the, uh, the idea that, a, that you have to do certain things to, go to, to earn your way to heaven. Of course, that's false as well. Just because God requires us to do something doesn't mean we're working, doesn't mean we're earning our salvation.
mm -hmm. in the actions uh, that we take in our normal daily living, how we interact with others, how we go about our work. And, and those attitudes, those, I think, are, are more the idea of a uh, Christian mm -hmm. work. Whereas before becoming a Christian, perhaps we were selfish. Yeah. It was take care of me and how can I get mm -hmm. what I want and forget everybody else. So just by Mm -hmm. which meant taking something that you had or that you purchased mm -hmm. and you 